started. Make sure that we're recording here. Great. Welcome, everybody. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. And we have a wonderful group of presenters today to talk about some considerations for what we know to be an uncertain fall, ensuring readiness for faculty as well as students. As we go through today, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A. And we'll also be adding links, including links to the PowerPoint presentation into the chat box. And feel free to share other resources if you have any great um, tips please put them in the chat box, that kind of thing. And we will have a pretty active Twitter back channel, I would anticipate. The hashtag is WCET webcast. You can also post your questions there. We'll be watching Twitter and the Q&A here. As we move through today, we'll do brief introductions. We'll talk about what we've learned from our experiences thus far. How do we develop quality experiences and plan for ad adaptability? and look at faculty and student support, and then we'll move to the Q&A. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question and answer box. We'll be monitoring that. We'll hold questions until the end of the discussion portion and the presentation, and then we'll be sure to get to your questions. If we don't get to all the questions, we'll be sure to pull those out and share them with our presenters and then get answers back to you. Our moderator today is a good friend and steering committee member for WCET. Shannon Riggs, who's the Executive Director of Academic Programs and Learning Innovation at the Oregon State University eCampus. Shannon, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, it's so nice to be here today. I'm really excited. Um, as, with, as with many of you, I've been involved in so many conversations about COVID-19 and remote teaching and online teaching and preparing for fall. I'm really excited to, to be part of this conversation today. Uh, today's webinar is really about um, it's about the COVID-19 and its impacts on the education space. But more specifically, what we'll focus on today is how we in higher ed are working to ensure readiness for fall when we don't really know what fall will bring at this point. Um, fortunately, we have a panel of experts with us today and all of you, um, and we're ready for some good conversation. So joining us today are Christina Anderson, David Capranos, and Jason Rohde. I will now ask them each to introduce themselves, their role and their organization, and uh, the, our opening question. If you were not working in higher education today, what, would you, what, what other career might you be in? Christina, let's start with you. Great, hi everyone, I'm happy to be here today. Um, my role is Director of Learner Experience, which means that my team at Wiley Ed Services works closely with faculty in designing and developing their online courses. So we support over um, hundreds of faculty a year in this endeavor. In case you're not familiar with our division of Wiley, uh, Wiley Ed Services supports over 60 university partners and over 800 online degree programs on behalf of those partners. Um, so as for my background, I've worked in online learning for almost 20 years now. Um, and thanks to COVID, I think finally all my friends and family uh, know what online learning is, and what I do for a living. <laughs> um, and I think if I were not in education, uh, I might be an architect. So I think that architects marry form and function in a way that is not that dissimilar from learning design. Hi, um, I'm David Capranis. I'm our Director of Market Strategy and Research. Um, we're essentially a decision support uh, team within the business. So we help our institutional partners uh, and our company decide where to invest, uh, particularly around online learning, but all types of learning. Um, yeah, I've been with Wiley for about 10 years. Um, if I was doing something other than uh, higher education, it would probably be in economics. I'd probably still be doing similar sort of work just for another industry. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Jason Rohde. I'm Executive Director of Extended Learning at Northern Illinois University. Uh, in my role, I serve as Chief Online Officer for the university. Um, I also oversee our Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. So. Um, a lot like the shop and staff that Christina oversees directly in Wiley, uh, I've got a, a much smaller team that uh, supports our faculty on our campus. Um, I'm also faculty within our College of Education in our Department of Educational Technology Research and Assessment. Um, if I were to uh, be doing something other than, I've been in higher ed now uh, almost 20 years as well, um, I'd probably say a wilderness guide. 
uh, I love the outdoors, but thinking about um, just the unknowns and being able to traverse those, I think certainly in this environment, we're doing the same thing um, in our respective industries. Great. Thank you so much. It's, it's just wonderful to have you all here with us today. What I'd like to cover today with our panelists are three considerations as we prepare for fall and higher ed. First, uh, what have we learned this spring from our move to remote learning environments? Second, how to plan and develop the best quality learning experiences while preparing to be adaptable? And third, conceptualizing what supports for students and faculty look like when we're planning flexibly. Um, so let's start with that first consideration, um, which is lessons from this spring. So our first question, um, we saw a major shift from campus-based learning to remote learning environments this past spring. But what are some of the key differences between these remote or virtual learning environments and traditional online learning? And I, I just have to share that I love being able to say traditional online learning. That gives me a thrill like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> <laughs> Christ Christina, can we start with you? Yes, um, I have a lot to say about this. I'll try to just highlight some major differences, but I share your sentiment, Shannon. Um, and first I can say, I don't think that um, we can say there was a singular approach to remote learning in the spring, right? Because everyone was just doing the best they could to get online quickly. Um, in many cases though, we did see a heavy reliance on virtual synchronous sessions like Zoom classes. And this is different than what we do when we have time um, to plan for courses online specifically. And so when we have time to plan and we're designing for online, we often talk about transforming the residential course and not just transferring it to the LMS. And so this lets us take advantage of the online modality, but it really also helps us recognize the constraints that our online students face. So whether that's internet access or obligations like work and caregiving, there can be a lot of obstacles to learning online. And so a couple of ways we try to lower these barriers include giving students flexibility in when they participate in their online learning um, and giving them choices when possible. And then we also know we have to use different strategies to be effective online and achieve the same outcome. So just to touch on a couple of these, I think a big difference is with connection. So in traditional online courses, we don't have the luxury of forging that personal relationship face to face. So we have to create those opportunities for students to connect with each other and for faculty to have you know, a meaningful and intentional presence in the course. Um, and then finally, we take a lot of care with how we organize and deliver the content for learning. So we know that student engagement in lecture videos drops after minutes. So we're thoughtful about how we can chunk content and use different methods of delivery, how we can use techniques like storytelling to support retention, and then also how we can create opportunities for active learning. And I think all of these things can be really hard to replicate online when you don't have the time to plan when you're in a remote emergency situation. Great. Jason or David, would you like to add anything to that? I think I think you nailed it. We um, we actually did a, uh, a survey of um, face to face students uh, and, and, you know, kind of asked questions around what types of learning experiences they're going uh, through right now. And, and it was really interesting to see their reaction, uh, you know, mirrors a lot of what Christina had to say. Great, well, while we're still trying to understand the full impact that the shift to remote learning has had on students, um, can you tell us a little more about the early feedback or insights we've gathered from students who were impacted this way? Yeah, so like I said, we, uh, we partnered with, um, I think a half dozen universities across the country uh, to um, ask their, their face-to-face -face students, they're, they're kind of typical ground students and, and professors that had to move quickly into this emergency remote sort of teaching situation, um, you know, how, how they reacted and how they responded to it. And we've got some really interesting data. Um, the, the headline is that 94% uh, of these students said they want to come back uh, in the fall, uh, which I know there was, you know, this, we often joke this is the pandemic that launched a thousand uh, student surveys because uh, there's so many out there, out there right now. And, and a lot of the early ones said, you know, 20% of students aren't going to come back, 25% of students aren't going to come back, and it really doesn't seem like that's going to be uh, the case right now, but there, there still are a pretty significant amount of students that are, that are concerned about coming back, and a lot of their concerns around um, are not financial. We were surprised. They were around online learning. Um, they were about, you know, kind of the online learning and the hybrid learning that they might get in the fall and, and you know, what that's going to look like for them. Um, it was really interesting because we were able to survey uh, I think it was about 4,000 students and about 500 faculty members, and there was a lot of things that they agreed upon, 
um, you, you know, generally speaking, the things they, they really agreed upon was um, how important the, the human element was. So a lot of them really liked some of that live video, right? Like the, um, the Zoom session uh, type work where you're really interacting with someone, things that, that mimic uh, sort of the human element that we would get on campus, um, unsurprisingly, right? Like phone calls and stuff like that. Pre-recorded video, a lot less so. And, and Christina mentioned that, that there's sort of this drop off when you just uh, set up a steady cam and, and record yourself lecturing. Like, I don't think any of us can really sit through uh, that you need that that sort of interaction part um, where we saw a lot of disagreement where the faculty thought they were doing a really great job but the students maybe didn't didn't enjoy things so much was around digital reading material um, and, and discussion boards interestingly and this one was particularly interesting for me because um, a lot of the data that we have from our traditional online learners is they love discussion boards uh, they love that opportunity to interact with each other they really like that human element uh, but there's something about these, uh, you know, face-to-face uh, -face students that really didn't like the way that some of that was managed. Um, so maybe there's some opportunities to make that better. Uh, the last thing that I'll say is that um, I think it was something like two-thirds of our students said they spent a lot more time uh, in these emergency remote classes than they would have in a traditional class. So we're doing something that's, that's really kind of burdensome uh, to these students, and I think there's a real concern there, uh, something that we have to be aware of. In fact, a lot of the students that reported that they were, um, you know, dissatisfied with this education or really felt that they weren't weren't happy with the education, um, almost all of those students uh, reported that they spent much more time uh, than they would have in a typical semester. So there's definitely something there about the time commitment um, that we should be communicating to students that you know we're working on that for the fall and, and maybe these aren't going to be as burdensome as they were in the spring. Were there any preferences noted about the different tools that were that were used? So whether it's email or discussion boards or Zoom, was there a certain way that those were used that students preferred or didn't prefer? Yeah, so, so generally, um, students really enjoyed one-on-one -on -one contact. Uh, so there, there was um, a lot of phone call, that sort of thing, um, you know, just sort of traditional conversation uh, was something that, that was really popular. And then uh, Zoom and other web conferencing type things um, were, pro were probably also really, um, you know, reported as, as being really successful for students. They really liked to interact with each other. Um, which is interesting because uh, when we think about the more traditional online learner, those synchronous elements, those elements where you, you know, you have to be on from four to five o'clock on a Wednesday might just not be realistic for a lot of the more traditional adult learner. Um, you know, so it's, it's an interesting sort of paradox that we've got there uh, that they, they like the interaction, they like that human element, but how do you do that within people's schedules? I think it's going to be uh, where part of the challenge lies. And I know it's still early days and, and much remains to be seen and things can be changed, but um, I think the big question on many people's minds are, are students planning on continuing in the fall? Will they be back on campus? Um, what does your crystal ball tell us? Uh, they'll, they'll be back eventually. Um, is something that we can take uh, confidently uh, that at some point in the future they'll be back. I think what we're going to see is a lot of hybrid, um, you know, type stuff early days. I think it'll be a lot of choice oriented is, is my guess is that it'll be, you know, you can, you can attend remotely if you want, but you can come to campus if you want as well. I think the, um, one of the things that we heard from a lot of students is that they're really concerned about the lack of, um, you know, sort of the campus experience elements. Like, so are there going to be football games? Are there going to be, you know, uh, Greek life and some of these other things uh, that are likely to, to see real restrictions? And so I think that'll be a factor for a lot of uh, particularly undergraduate students on whether or not coming to campus makes sense for them. Well, you know, we're certainly aware of the major impacts to students, but I don't think we can ignore the impact that this transition to remote has had on faculty, you know, many of whom have had limited or no experience um, teaching, teaching you know, outside of teaching in a physical classroom setting. Uh, so what were some of the biggest challenges to navigate for faculty, um, and have we seen any major successes? Great question, and, and I think um, obviously at our institutions, you know, we first and foremost, we're, we're thinking about our students and committed to our students, but our faculty encountered many of those same challenges that our students had as we were making that quick pivot. Um, you know, if you think about uh, many of us here on the call, right, you had children with virtual schooling that you're trying to manage at home, um, just the dynamic of working at home, um, and trying to access technology and, and share the technology with, with other family members who are doing the same, right? So, so even those who had had that access, uh, had challenges within that access. And I think um, despite these challenges, um, you know, at our institutions, we've just seen faculty rise to the occasion. And it's been uh, really inspiring. I'm sure, you know, those of you participating today, you've had 
conversations, you've heard anecdotes from your faculty. I know I, we've heard it from our, our faculty at our institution, um, how you know, they were creative in adapting their practices on such short notice. Um, and you know, often what we saw, and I, I think Christina, you mentioned this earlier, right? That faculty, many of them started looking at just synchronous tools and solutions that could replace what they were doing in the classroom. It, it seemed like the easiest proxy for what they were already doing. Um, we saw a huge spike during the first several weeks when we had made that pivot to, to using um, synchronous meeting tools. It was on the order of magnitude of around 40 times what normal usage was. Um, and then what we, what we saw is usage of those tools, it started to plateau a bit. And um, we anecdotally in, in conversation with faculty, it seems like faculty started looking at some other asynchronous methods that provided that added flexibility that David, I think you mentioned. Um, and it served both the faculty and the students, right, to, to provide that, that flexibility there. Um, you know, so another thing that we saw with faculty is that by and large, um, over the spring, they kept using technology tools they were already familiar with and comfortable with. Um, you know, for faculty who, if they weren't using a synchronous tool, um, most did investigate one of those and mm -hmm. at least try that. But um, what we've, um, uh, we've tried to in just encourage faculty during the spring, use what's comfortable, uh, what they're, you know, uh, able to, to use on, on such short notice. And I think what encouraged that really was the fact that our entire campus, I think as all of our campuses were just plunged into this remote uh, collaboration and working environment. And it lowered the barriers for a lot of folks who maybe would have been um, concerned about having it all perfect the first time. Um, I think there was a lot of grace in people getting in and trying it. Um, I mean, across higher ed, I think everyone will agree that we've made some very drastic shifts um, in our ways of working, how we communicate, how we collaborate. Um, that's gonna, you know, forever change how we operate. And so, you know, we're looking now at what are those lessons learned and how can we continue to embrace um, you know, those good things, that, those good steps forward that we took um, into the future. Great. Christina, do you have anything to add from maybe the academic services perspective? Yeah, I think Jason hit most of it on the head. We saw a lot of willingness to try new things and a lot of creativity and collaboration that I think um, for online learning going forward will lead to a lot of innovative experiences for students. Um, and I think for those of us who have been online already, you know, one of the silver linings of all of this, if you can count it as a success, is just that it seems to be elevating the discussion of quality in online learning, right? And so quality hopefully will not be measured by the modality or the format that you're in, but really the planning you put into your course and how you teach the course in whichever format it is. Well, that's just a great transition to our next consideration. So if we can shift to that, um, that middle area there on the screen. Uh, so planning for the, the best quality learning, teaching and learning experiences as we're preparing to be adaptable, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Um, so how do you think the experiences of spring and summer will shape the expectations for fall for both the students and the faculty? Yeah, so I'll take that one. And again, you know, relying on heavily on survey data, um, we, we monitor the, you know, sort of online student and their evolving attitude um, pretty regularly. We do a lot of surveys uh, throughout the year. And, and the one thing that's really consistent is students tell us that uh, flexibility is sort of their primary concern. Um, you know, they, they want to have a flexible environment. They want to be able to, to you know, adapt to uh, those, those home pressures that we were just talking about, right, where, um, you know, and, and different scheduling and workload and things like that. Um, but they want to balance that with really getting a lot of this human element. And I think that, uh, you know, Jason, you just mentioned that sort of fatigue burnout that happened with, with Zoom uh, calls where it's like in the early days, we all were, you know, jumping on these Zoom calls. But I think at a certain point, you get, you know, enough is enough, right? And we got to think about some alternatives. So I think we're really going to have to balance how do we, uh, you know, communicate to students that we've, we've got the flexibility that they need, that, but we're still going to be able to, to sort of engage them in these human ways. Um, and, you know, some of that is going to be some of the tools that Christina mentioned, you know, like on sort of shorter video or more engaging exercises or, you know, using different types of sort of tools and techniques out there. Um, you know, I think the, the communication that what you experienced in the spring is not necessarily what you're going to experience in the fall, really letting students know, hey, we hear you on, 
uh, you know, that was our, you know, emergency response and we did the best we could and sort of acknowledging that I think is going to be something that's going to be really important as well. Um, you know, that we hear your concerns on, on the time element or on the, you know, interpersonal, you know, connection element and then here's the ways that we're addressing it. Uh, having, seeing that clearly to students, I think is going to be important on whether or not they return. Yeah, and David, I would add, you know, not just for students, but for faculty, so a lot of faculty had a not great experience in the spring. And so yeah. how can we support them differently um, and, you know, support the idea that the way that online was in the spring isn't the only way that it can be or should be. Um, and your point earlier too, I think students, you know, there will be a lot more emphasis on kind of matching the rigor of the residential experience and on that connection and the human element. So how can we create ways to have um, those rich dialogues and discourse that just happen more organically face to face? Well, and I love that uh, comment you made, David, about flexible. Um, you know, we're, we're also throwing in the word resilient, you know, thinking about course yeah. design that can, can happen in any mode, right? And so mm -hmm. if things change again, come fall, that we've been purposeful and thinking through how that's designed, um, you know, and so I, I, that would be my encouragement to, to all institutions is to really look at, right, those experts that you have who are there supporting your faculty already and empower them to have these conversations. Um, there's an openness and a willingness right now um, across higher ed and within our institutions, I think to embrace some of these new approaches that maybe we haven't seen in quite a while. And it's a great opportunity for us. Um, another silver lining, right, is to, to look at, you know, how can we make, have more robust types of course designs that can withstand and can change as uh, you might need to pivot that mode of delivery. Great, thank you. Well, what are some strategies for, for planning for that flexibility? Um, do you think that we'll see a mix of schools choosing to go online, return to campus fully, or some kind of blended modality? What, what do you expect? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, a, a lot of schools already have this stuff in place, right? I, I think a lot of schools have, have already worked to have that, that um, you know, assisted platform where, where maybe you're submitting your grades online or your discussion board or things like that. And so I think for a lot of schools, it's there a certain class of school is already pretty innovative and already has you know pretty significant investment where where this the, the sort of our architecture is in place for them um what i'm concerned about is the schools that are maybe a little bit smaller and, and and you know maybe haven't really thought about some of these things in the past they've really you know kind of insulated themselves from some of these innovations and, and i think there's there's a real challenge there uh for them and, and what we're likely to see is the schools that were already embracing some online learning and some sort of tech enabled uh, kind of work are, are likely going to do to Jason's point these these resilient sort of adaptable flexible like hybrid flex kind of models um, that, that I think are really going to be uh, you know likely what's what's going to be um, you know in the market moving forward uh, you know what I'm also interested in too is to see how this impacts sort of different types of degrees right I think there's going to be certain um, disciplines that that probably respond to this better than others, right? Um, you know, we did a lot of work in our study to ask about uh, sort of labs and and you know hands-on type of experiences and how those were impacted. And there were certain classes that were just you know based on you know kind of field trips or internships or, or different things that were sort of very you know physical and very like presence and connection to place was really important had to be eliminated. And how do you how do you bring those back? Do they just get struck from uh, you know, the catalog or, or do you find kind of ways to, uh, to do those types of programs moving forward? Very interesting. Uh, Christina, do you have anything to add from the, the academic services side? Yeah, so the way that we've been thinking about this uh, um, are kind of that there are different levels and layers of planning that need to happen, right? So at the most fundamental level, institutions um, probably are already showing up infrastructure so like the learning management system video conferencing technologies tech support and faculty development mm -hmm. um, and in some cases you know remote student services as we're seeing more of a need for those mm -hmm. um, and i think at the program or course level just different planning needs to happen and i liked what you said jason about it being purposeful um, so you know we always start with the student learning outcomes and your outcomes won't change if you're face-to-face -face or online or hybrid but how you approach them might change. Um, and so I would think about planning differently, right? So think about which outcomes would take more work to transform to online or hybrid um, and start thinking about this now and planning for that. And then 
At the next layer, think about what material you absolutely must cover synchronously. And for that material, how might you teach it virtually? So either if you're remote or half your students are remote, you know, what can you do to make that a great experience? Um, and then for that material that can be covered asynchronously, how can you have that prepared in the LMS and ready to go um, for whichever modality you're in? So I think doing that preparation will help you flex, you know, from face to face or to hybrid to online. Because um, one fear too is that this could change overnight again, right? Mm -hmm. If cases spike on your campus and there's an emergency closure, um, you want to be as prepared as you can. Here's some great instructional design um, strategy there, you know, just starting with the outcomes, backward design, I mm -hmm. just warms my heart. <laughs> let's, um, let's shift to uh, the, the third consideration. Um, so the, the gray box on the screen there, you know, what support might look like for students and faculty when it comes to planning flexibly? What do, what do people need to be able to transition? I'm hearing a lot of things about um, folks being resilient, adaptable, flexible, those all sound like a workout to me. <laughs> it needs training and, and uh, needs preparation, right? Um, yeah, well, and, I, and I, if I can jump in and say, sure. you know, I, I think we're thinking a lot um, at our campus about just that overall experience. Um, I think it was already been mentioned, right, that, that there's, um, to David's point about some of the concerns that students might have coming back, you know, what's that experience going to be like for our students? and for our faculty. And um, we're almost looking at it as having to kind of retell the story of, of what, what it means to be an NIU Husky, right? And, um, you know, we're all of our campuses, uh, you know, we, we're all juggling these different forces that we're trying to balance, right? There's, there's uh, public health and, and, and government guidelines that we're having to follow um, and collaborating with um, you know, experts on our campus to try to interpolate those, think about how do we roll those out and how do we function in a way that, that follows those guidelines. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at about an 80% reduction in our classroom capacity to follow social distancing guidelines. So, you know, to accommodate that, we're looking at a lot of different things to support our students, thinking about things like staggered schedule type courses where, you know, a, a course, um, you know, might, half of the students might meet you know, one time a week and the other half meet separately. And then there's, there's other hybrid or, or virtual activities that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're thinking a lot in supporting our students about just what are the activities, the co-curriculars, the, the engagement that will be available in person? How do we do that safely? And then what are the uh, kind of virtual and, and community types of, of uh, interactions that can happen to go along with that? Um, so really looking at all aspects of, of campus life. Um, mm -hmm. working with our student advisory groups to to hear from them as to what they expect and what, what do they want to see um, and you know our we've adopted the mantra you know huskies never quit and we're resilient as a community and so mm -hmm. how do we how do we embrace that together and and, and come together along that those lines um, but I just I just think communicating this and back to I think David you, you mentioned this earlier um, communicating that plan to students that there is a plan um, I think is critical that students know that yes, fall is going to be different than any other fall we've had, uh, but we're planning and we're going to embrace that and we're going to get through it together. Um, and then working together to coordinate, you know, uh, and execute a, a very targeted and coordinated communication of what's happening. Um, we, you know, we've pulled together a, a task force on our campus that's really looking at kind of all communications to students as we return to campus in the fall. And, and what does that need to look like? So you've got housing and dining and bursar and financial aid, and there's all these different messages, right, that students need to have and making sure it's in a coordinated, consistent way um, so that we're not just completely overwhelming students and faculty with, you know, with, with so many messages. Mm -hmm. You know, given the, the likelihood that um, many institutions will need to expand remote learning or take more of a blended approach as you're talking about like reducing the class sizes uh, because of social distancing measures. Are there any um, specific tools or methods that you would recommend that faculty integrate um, that would help? Well, I, I'll just, I'll jump in first. I would just say um, communication is so important and however you do it, whatever the platforms that your students are already using, try to maximize those. Um, we just had a conversation on our campus. We have a mobile app for our institution 
that's been nice to have, but it hasn't been the kind of go-to place to communicate out to students. And, and really a mobile platform is the lowest common denominator nowadays. Um, you look at most surveys, um, David will confirm this, but most students, they have a smartphone nowadays, um, some type of mobile device, right? And so thinking about how do you communicate in a format that's easily accessible um, to those students. And so if, you're, if your institution has some type of tool that's maybe already available, but maybe you haven't leveraged it, maybe you're not texting, maybe you're not using some of these other uh, mechanisms, but you have them at your fingertips, mm -hmm. um, now's certainly the time to, to look to those. I, I continue to, to uh, caution our campus to, to, you know, in the spring, we just encourage faculty, use whatever you have, and then just, mm -hmm. just do the best you can, right? Mm -hmm. But we really need to think about that student experience for fall, and we want students using five different platforms in five different courses. What's that experience gonna be like for the students? How can we try to marry this idea of, you know, faculty choice and flexibility, but also that student experience and having some consistency uh, across courses. So I, I think that's a, an important consideration to keep in mind as you're looking at tools. Yeah, I think there's a real tension there, Jason, because you um, want fac faculty to have the choice, you want a rich experience for students, but you don't want everybody spending their time learning new tools and technologies, right? So when I think about kind of what what do you need to achieve and find the tool that works for that? So, you know, really get deep in if it's Zoom or Adobe Collaborate or whatever your synchronous tool is and understand how to use that. And then maybe you have a technology for um, recording some sort of lecture or creating graphics, right, to support your lecture content. Um, and then a way for students to interact with each other in group projects and to collaborate. Um, but I don't think the toolkit needs to be too broad or it'll be overwhelming um, to the faculty and the students. And then the other thing we'd suggest is that a lot of campuses um, have this expertise in the centers for teaching and learning or in groups like Jason's um, and reach out to those resources and see what tools they recommend and what sorts of training and support resources they have available. Yeah, I think one of the most challenging aspects that I, I've certainly heard on my, my home campus um, and just in other conversations is about the uh, courses that have those hands-on kind of components. Um, or that um, just really seem to depend on those face-to-face um, -face kinds of traditional classroom settings. Are there any approaches to um, how, how we might adapt those courses or um, bring or, or kind of rethink that, that kind of instruction for remote or, or virtual? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, um, you know, we, we partnered, uh, one of the schools that we worked with, uh, WPI, in uh, Massachusetts, they are, you know, an engineering school in many ways, right? And, and a lot of it is kind of technical sort of things. And, and it was interesting to hear all the anecdotal stories about professors boxing up, you know, kind of uh, pistons and stuff and mailing them out to students, right? Or, or driving out kit uh, to, to the individual students' homes and, you know, leaving it at the, the end of the driveway <laughs> so they can pick it up in a, in a responsible way. Um, you know, I think that uh, a lot of that is great you know, creative stopgap kind of stuff that, that was done in this like sort of emergency situation, but longer term, a lot of that stuff just probably doesn't make as much sense. And you, you probably have to think about how do we scale that appropriately? And how do we come up with uh, different types of experiences for students? And some of it can be really hands-on and mailed out, uh, mm -hmm. but you might want to partner with someone to help you manage some of that. I don't know if it, it can all be, um, you know, professors boxing up stuff in the lab and sending it out. Mm -hmm. Well, what about from the student perspective? I mean, what are we hearing from them that they they need? Yeah, um, so, so we've done quite a bit of, quite a bit of survey work um, and, and it was interesting. Uh, this group responded in ways that are very different than what we call like sort of that, that traditional online learner, right, Shannon? Um, you know, this group uh, was, was really uh, showed a high amount of stress around schoolwork. Uh, and like I said, I think part of it was around that time commitment element um, you know, like Jason and Christina mentioned, sort of learning new tools and some of the fatigue around that. Um, you know, there, there were some real challenges there. Uh, students are obviously really concerned about financial things, you know, and, and financial support and offers of financial support might be something that help, uh, helps to bridge the gap for some students on whether or not they return um, in this semester or future ones. Um, really a lot around uh, sort of social contact, um, you know, students reporting stresses around uh, just not being able to interact with other students, right? You know, kind of things that, that they were really looking forward to. You imagine someone 
freshman and sophomore year, you know, and, and, and it being kind of taken away from them. And we, and we really got a lot of responses there. Um, so ways that we can sort of promote that interaction, uh, take care of people's physical and mental health, I think are going to be really important in the fall as well. Yeah, and so I would add, and David, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but in the previous work that we've done, and we know these students and the experience is different, but I think some of these do apply. So we know that students beginning online programs are really concerned about the instructor interaction. So how timely will that response be? Um, what will I do without face-to-face -face interaction? What's the quality of instruction? Um, and we know it's frustrating to them, right? So this study was from over 2,000 online learners, and the largest frustrations that you see are are that lack of interaction and the timeliness of responses and inconsistency um, that Jason touched on earlier. Um, and then I think from some of the themes we've seen emerging from other surveys about the spring semester, it's all of the non-academic pieces that are stressful also. So students are asking for support with mental health services, with financial guidance, with technology. Um, so we can't leave all of that out of the discussion either. And if I can throw one more thing in too, in, uh, we've had some just virtual town halls with our students and, and different levels of conversations. And one of the things that's come up is uh, uh, students are a, a little bit just unsure of how ready they are to move on from what they learned in the spring, right? So, you know, we said, you know, we helped them finish out courses in the spring and, and did it as best we could, but, you know, they didn't get a chance in some of those hands-on or or other types of more applicable types of experiences to really get in and do it. Um, and so um, maybe they didn't get the kind of interaction or feedback like Christina was talking about that the students need. And so um, helping the students and helping our faculty think about how do we help reassure our students that um, we're gonna be there to help make sure they have, are ready to take that next step in that, that sequence of courses, um, ensuring that they have the skills are rock solid and, and ready to move on and be successful. Um, I think there's just kind of this uncertainty uh, with some of for, from some of our students that um, they're not sure if they're ready yet. And so how can we, maybe as we look at fall, think about um, building in a, an opportunity there for students to um, kind of revisit some of those, those skills and competencies and, and really make sure that they're ready to, to be successful moving forward. Jason, that's such a good yeah. point. I, I was going to just say, you know, I have a lot of concern about certain disciplines that are that are that stack, right? You think about, you know, math being an obvious one, computer programming, some of these other ones where where if you didn't really nail things in class one, class two is going to be much more difficult for you. And how do we, you know, ensure that those remedial sort of tutoring services or, you know, kind of additional things are available for students who are not just asking them to repeat classes they've already taken, but really helping them bridge that knowledge gap, I think is something that's really important. Yeah, and I think in addition to the content and skills, you know, we didn't always support students in learning how to learn online, where mm -hmm. when we are having our traditional online programs, we do spend time orienting students to the online environment, strategies that they might use, resources at their disposal. So I think as programs continue to be hybrid or to be remote, um, we can't lose sight of that sort of skill development in students as well. And you're going to have students coming in, you've got your returning students, but then you're going to have brand new students into these programs. And so they're going to have different sets of questions, different needs. Um, and so that really a multi-pronged communication approach is, is going to be essential. Great. Okay. How are we doing on time? I think we're, I think we're doing okay. Um, I think we can probably transition now to so there's a lot of questions pouring in through the, the Q&A and I know Megan is monitoring the chat and we'll hopefully jump in if there's a question that we need to bring in from the chat, but I can start with one from the, from the Q&A. Um, this one, it relates to something you were just talking about. Um, you know, can we use this experience as a teaching moment for the students to learn that in the workforce, it is vital to have the agility, flexibility, thinking outside of the box and willingness to move forward in a new way to achieve the necessary goals. Yeah, 100% sort of asked and answered there, right? Like, uh, <laughs> you know, I know Christina and I as colleagues uh, have probably never been on video more than we have in the, in the last few months here. And so it's, it's impacting all of us in a similar way. I think there's, there's definitely some, some lessons there to be learned. Um, you know, and, and I think ultimately too, not just for the students, but for the faculty as well, right? Like the, these are the realities that, that we're likely facing moving forward. And I think we've had some folks that are, you know, been able to be sort of isolated and, and in a really traditional sort of, you know, residential campus experience where, uh, you know, they can 
not really interact with a lot of technology and the reality is that at some point, you know, we're going to have to break through and they're going to have to set up a zoom call on their own or an email or things like that and, and kind of learn some of this stuff. Great. Um, you know, we're also having some questions. There's a couple of questions in the, in the Q and a regarding proctoring and academic integrity. So I wonder if the panel could, uh, could address those concerns. Yeah, so I'll, I'll maybe I'll jump in first and then let Christina take it from there. I, I know um, those were some of the early questions we had from our faculty. How am I going to deliver my exam, my midterm and my final exam? And so it, it really led to um, some broader conversations where we talked not just about, yes, there are proctoring solutions, and we have those, and, and, uh, but inherently um, there's challenges when you introduce those types of solutions. And so mm -hmm. Um, we at our campus, we have several different solutions that faculty can choose from, um, and they, they have different bells and whistles and pros and cons from more automated uh, types of uh, passive kinds of, of proctoring solutions to um, more what we'll call intrusive um, or you know, direct proctoring with a, with a live person. And mm -hmm. so, um, but before we would just suggest that, and, and anytime we talk about those solutions, we also talk side by side with thinking about your assessment. Why are you needing that? Are you thinking, have you thought about other types of authentic kinds of assessments? Mm -hmm. um, you can use um, lower stakes, you know, more of those objective types of assessments, maybe for lower stakes, but that higher, higher stakes types of assessment, we always advocate for, you know, thinking about um, opportunities for students to practically apply what they're doing and where you're not going to be so worried about uh, those academic integrity issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we take a very similar approach, Jason. Um, so trying to translate, and again, we know it was hard in the spring semester when there wasn't time to really transform those assessments. But if you can align those outcomes more to authentic assessments and research projects and case analyses or having students give presentations, right? And um, different approaches that are more difficult um, if you're concerned about cheating. Mm -hmm. Anything else to add on that or, or I can move on to oh, that? Yep. The only thing I would add to that is, is whatever you do plan on doing, communicate it, right? So, so you know, if, if you're having those, those internal conversations, um, you know, and making those decisions, let the students know, right? Let the students know that we're, we're adapting and we're changing and, and we're, we're trying to, um, f you know, meet the moment. Uh, I think that will be important to, to relieve some of the stress that they're, they're going to be feeling. That communication piece seems really important. Uh, um, there's a question related to that in the Q&A. Um, Norma Hollaback has asked, she, she's concerned with students' response about timeliness of instructor's response, as some or many of the students may be expecting the faculty to respond at midnight or other kind of off times. Um, and students tend to keep unusual schedules and think faculty should be responding immediately, no matter what time of the day or night. You know, if I can get into my classroom 24 seven, then I should have a, you know, get that answer 24 seven might, um, might be the expectation. So, um, so what are your thoughts about how to address that? I was looking at that one uh, because that's a common concern that we hear. And I think to David's point about reiterating that communication and clearly outlining um, when you're available, what your response time will be, is it different certain days of the week? Um, and your preferred mode of communication too. So do you have maybe a discussion forum where you can post questions and answers that other students might be able to respond to? Um, as opposed to every student sending you an individual email. Yeah, and just being upfront with, with the students, if you're gonna be delayed, um, it, it's not necessarily bad that it might take you a little longer, but just letting them know, hey, I'm, I'm gonna be traveling or I'm gonna be offline for a couple of days. Um, just being transparent with students, um, I think students appreciate that, it's authentic. Um, you know, I'll often, want to communicate something out and rather than you know hammer out an email maybe just a quick minute quick video or something to share with students right it just adds that kind of personal connection but we're communicating to our students um, it is something that we're, we're, we're stressing is that you can expect faculty to be they're going to be engaging with you mm -hmm. and that there, there's going to be that that prompt response and I think um, at our institutions we need to clearly articulate that expectation to our faculty that part of teaching, right? You would, if you were in the classroom, you would be having those interactions with the students. And so if you're going to be in the online or, or remote arena, you need to find ways to have that sense of presence with your students. Um, that's important. 
so that leads to one of the other questions um, in the Q and A, and you know, for faculty who who are so used to and they really only have experience on that face to face mm -hmm. traditional classroom setting. You know, what are the tools when you, when you say just make a video for your students? What if as a faculty member that is <laughs> not a familiar thing for you? Are there are there specific tools that you would recommend or that you do recommend at your campus or does it depend or what would you say to that for the faculty who are, you know, kind of stymied by that? Well, I always start with what's simple and what I have. So, I mean, it's it's my phone. Um, I'm using a lot of free apps, things that just I have easy access to and my students have easy access to. Um, and so we've used this whole COVID experience to really um, showcase uh, the tools that are already at faculty's fingertips that they can use. You know, if it's the laptop and it's the webcam on their laptop and how can they use a, the free app that's on their laptop, if it's a Mac or Windows, right, to record some video um, and then easily share it with their students. Um, using devices that they have. So we're actually, we're doing a whole um, teaching effectiveness institute later in August when faculty come back, just thinking about video, simple things you can do with video, um, how you can quickly record something, not just a personal message, it could be some kind of quick demonstration, uh, quick how-to, it could be a screencast demonstrating a, a type of a skill. These tools, you don't have to do a lot of polishing, editing, um, they're quick, they're easy. Um, a lot of the platforms where you upload them or share them in the cloud have, you know, auto captioning that's getting really good to the point where, um, you know, it, it really helps you um, without a, a lot of extra effort, make sure that your content's accessible. Um, so, again, I think back to the spring where the bar was lowered in the sense of the barrier to entry with a lot of these tools um, mm -hmm. and just getting in and trying it, I think, is, is just the message we keep reiterating the faculty. And so often when we have those kinds of conversations, you know, use the tools that you have, often the next question uh, or the next consideration is for how do we make those materials accessible for students who may have disabilities. Um, so um, Jillian Zayner in the, in the Q&A has asked, what academic adjustments could be used or could be implemented to support students with disabilities? Yeah, so from a design perspective, and I know Jason, if you have other advice, but um, we usually start with uh, universal design for learning as far as principles of being inclusive and designing for students with different needs. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, I think it's a great resource. And then I would also say this could vary by campus as far as mm -hmm. what access, um, or I'm sorry, what resources your Office of Accessibility or Disability Services might provide as well. Um, so I think if you think broadly about designing the materials, um, and there's some some good pointers too, right? So if you're recording um, a video and you're speaking to visuals and you know that this will be transcribed, you can't just say, well, as you can see here, right? And assume that everybody can see that, but you might want to describe what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. so that'd be a good place to start if you're, if you're not familiar. And then as Jason mentioned too, a lot of the tools um, now for video, the auto transcription is really reaching a high percentage of accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, so starting to explore what resources you have available to you on your campus is a good place as well. Another kind of related access question that's come up a couple of times in the Q&A is um, relating to um, the internet availability and, and, and student connection speeds. Um, what about, you know, how do, we, how do we bridge that gap for students uh, who don't have good internet or good devices? That's a huge, uh, huge concern. Um, you know, we, our campus, we serve a, a very large population that, that um, we, we found didn't have automatic have access at, at home. And so we had a lot of questions in the spring, just where do I find Wi-Fi? What do I do? We had, you know, students sitting in the parking lot at McDonald's, right, connecting to the free Wi-Fi to be able to, to get online. And so um, something we're actively thinking about is how do we ensure that students are ready for fall, what what technology do they have? What are the gaps that they have? So thinking about just devices, but also the network connectivity. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, the the providers were really quick in the spring to provide complementary access or to to increase um, bandwidth on on access. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of these variables that are beyond our control. And uh, I think back to to communication, finding out what the needs are. Um, we've I've just kind of solicited an opportunity for students to 
um, apply for uh, small like grants, some funds to help cover, you know, it's up to $500, but to, to kind of help cover some of those costs that they needed to purchase some, some network access or um, we had a few, you know, some, some uh, mobile hotspots that we could uh, provide and students could check out from the library. So just trying to be resourceful with what you have um, and just, I think, asking what are the needs and trying to connect what resources you do have with the needs that, that you're hearing from the students. Great. What about um, international students? So the question in the, in the chat is, um, how are you handling, handling international students who may be, uh, you know, six to 12 or more hours ahead? So for example, New York City to London to China of the time that the class would be online for those with the synchronous components. So we've seen some of our partners um, rotate when those synchronous sessions are offered um, to hit different time zones and always to record the sessions. So it's not the same to watch the recording, but at least you do have access to the content. Um, and then providing virtual office hours potentially at different times as well. Um, so again, giving students a little bit of choice and flexibility to the extent that you can accommodate it. Great. Uh, another question, uh, are textbook publishers rolling out improved testing and quizzing capabilities or flexibilities for instructors to use? I don't know that the publishers move that quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think no one from Wiley Publishing is listening to that. Um, but I do think that depending on your discipline, there are a lot of digital tools out there, many of which are adaptive and have all of that sort of branching based on the student response built in, mm -hmm. um, would be my guess. But maybe this will be, I mean, to our point about the innovations that will come out of this, you know, maybe that will be one that we'll see in the next, you know, six to 12 months. Great. Now, there's another question here that's kind of a different angle that I don't think we've covered exactly yet. Um, what about institutions who have experiences like internships, field work? We've talked a little bit about labs and those kind of materials, but what about those experiential learning kinds of opportunities? Um, what are institutions doing to, to um, provide those experiences for students? This is an interesting one for me because I know that we've we've had interns in the past that are that were remote in nature. We've got a few different offices and so you might have an intern that is in your Chicago office, but they're working with someone in your Orlando office and using some of the um, You know, tools that have become really common, right, like Zoom and things like that, but we were doing that years ago. So I think there are creative ways to do that. I know Christina too could probably speak to um, Some of the things that we've done to create sort of virtual field trip types of opportunities where we're um, you know, going into facilities for a course and sort of videotaping it and, and, you know, finding ways to sort of have that real world opportunity, but happen in, in a virtual, sometimes even 3D virtual, you know, kind of space, um, you know, is, is something that we've already seen developed. And, and so I think it's just a question about like the application, how quickly we can get stuff up and running. And I think there was a question about related to this about the accreditation. And I know, for mm -hmm. example, um, the CSWE for social work education um, is changing their requirements, say, um, to allow like virtual counseling to count towards your uh, clinical hours and that sort of thing. Um, so I think we are seeing some changes there depending on the discipline. We've also seen, um, you know, on the, on the admission side of things, uh, you know, kind of a, a related question, we've seen some easing of of like testing requirements and some schools are, are going to be waiving SAT requirements and, and GRE and GMAT requirements things along those lines for the upcoming semesters uh, just because they're they're so challenging to uh, to get done. Great. There are some a couple of questions around the idea of shortened classes. Um, uh, how do you keep from compromising the curriculum when the 14 week semesters have been shortened to six and seven weeks? And then some questions around the Carnegie units um, measured by seat time in traditional classroom. How are we measuring that in um, in an you know in a remote space or and that may be con condensed? Jason, you want this or do you want me to jump in? I'll let you take it, Christina. <laughs> um, yeah, so we we have some calculators that we use to. Um, to make that calculation, you know, between the face time that you would typically have in person to what that translates to online. So there are equivalencies for 
how much time you might spend drafting a response to an online discussion or how much time you might spend reading materials that might otherwise be lectured. Um, so again, this goes back to that kind of having time to plan um, and really be intentional about how you um, how you use that time differently, right? Because you don't want to be lecturing online uh, necessarily for the same time that you might do in person, but you can substitute other activities and come up with that equivalent speak time. Great. Um, let's see. Someone's asking about COVID testing for students on campus um, and wondering if it should be mandatory, optional, dependent on supplies. What does that what does that look like? That's a great question. Um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe David could speak to. That. I don't know if, if students are expressing interest through through the surveys and such. I think from our perspective, we are we are leaning and, and erring on the side of caution with our communications with our students. And um, we are um, we've not explicitly stated in our kind of return to campus guidelines, um, you know, a frequency by which testing should occur. But we do have guidelines for. Um, all of our campus community, faculty, staff, and students in terms of just wellness, mm -hmm. um, kind of self checks that they every day, um, you know, should should uh, consider Here's a, a checklist of things. And if, if you feel any of these things, don't come to work um, mm -hmm. and get tested. So um, there are things you can do that are short of a full blown, um, you know, formal test that really help promote a, a sense of, of self care and of, of just understanding that we as a community are here to um, support one another and, and our actions have influence on on the rest of the campus. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is, is you know, obviously you're gonna have to follow federal and local guidelines, um, but but I think for the students communication is gonna be key, right? So to something as simple as printing out these these guidelines and pasting them, you know, on, on the door to the facility, or like if, you, if you've got a fever, don't enter the building, you know, th those sorts of things. I think um, you might think they go without saying, but but really they, they don't, you know, you, you need to say them and you need to have them out there. Well, a follow up question to that from Judith uh, Sebesta in our in our audience is a hypothetical question. In a high flex model where say 50% of students in a course can be accommodated in the physical classroom. So 50% need to be remote or online. What do we do if 75% of the students prefer the classroom? How does one decide who gets to do what and avoid a potentially detrimental have and have nots kind of situation? It's really an ethical dilemma. I've actually taken classes in these models and, and, and seen, you know, kind of first come first serve situations where uh, if you don't show up 15, 20 minutes, you know, early to get a seat with this rock star lecturer, you're, you're not going to get a seat that day and you're going to have to watch it on your laptop in the hallway. And, and it does create, um, some stress there. So I, I think it's something that, that you know, it is um, an interesting thing to consider. Um, you know, and yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that one, what you'd be able to do to sort of mitigate it with, you know, a lottery system or something along those lines. I'm sure there's creative solutions out there, but, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Great. Uh, let's see. I think we probably have time to squeeze in one more, one more question. Um, let's go with a t one from Tom Frederick. It's my experience that students can adapt to online instruction better than many faculty. Um, how do you bring faculty to comfort? One of the things we've done is just trying to link, link faculty with one another. So faculty love to hear from their colleagues. Um, we launched, we called it a remote teaching fellow program in the spring where we just mm -hmm. asked, hey faculty, if you, if you're comfortable in this space and you'd be willing to, um, you know, meet virtually with a colleague and just kind of share your experience. And we had over 30 faculty from across all of our colleges uh, be willing to do that. And so we just quickly arranged a, a quick means by which, um, you know, faculty could book an appointment with a colleague to, to talk about their class and kind of the challenges that they were facing. And so I would look for those kinds of opportunities where you can kind of get your, your rock star faculty who are leading in this space to come alongside and, and share their expertise with others. I love that. And I would say one additional thing is to encourage your faculty to become an online student. So um, whether it's taking a, a course that 
teaches you how to teach online or whether it's you know enrolling in a MOOC which is a different format but it still creates that sense of empathy about what is the online student going through and what is their experience like. Well great I'm going to jump in quickly because we're at the end of the hour but mm -hmm. I just want to say to the audience thank you for the excellent questions in the chat this has been a really really good conversation thank you so much to our our presenters Christina Jason and David and Shannon, of course, for moderating. So if this is your first WCT webcast, be sure to visit our website. And many of the questions that were asked today, we've covered in our blog series, which is WCET Frontiers, and that's free and open to everybody. So be sure to get on there and you can subscribe to our blog. Um, we, we do a lot around policy and education. So much of your questions we hear and we're doing all we can to make sure that we're providing resources and content that's just in time. So Wiley has provided numerous resources here. We'll also add those links to the chat. This was recorded and we'll be sure to add captions and then send that back out hopefully today. And again, just stay tuned to our webcast. Uh, we'd like to thank our supporting members as well as our sponsors that help underwrite much of our programming and events here at WCET. So hopefully we see you at our next event. Thank you so much for your time. All stay well. Thank you. Take care. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone.